Uh, our panelists are Jan Stewart, uh, Paul Sankey, and Roger Dewan. Uh, Jan has just recently joined the Wall Street research firm Cornerstone Capital Group uh, that is involved in a lot of, uh, of environmental, social, and uh, governance issues. Uh, he's their chief energy strategist. Uh, he's had a long career doing that on Wall Street. Uh, Paul Sankey is uh, managing director and senior analyst at Wolf Research, an independent um, research, um, equity research firm in New York, focusing, Paul focuses obviously on global oil and gas markets. Uh, worked with Paul for a long time at Deutsche Bank, uh, and before that, uh, when he was at Wood McKenzie. And uh, the uh, Third speaker is going to be Roger Dewan, who's uh, at IHS Market. Uh, he heads their dedicated research team that provides integrated advisory services for the financial sector. Uh, he's uh, been involved in doing uh, short and medium term oil market analysis um, with a focus on the Middle East and emerging shale gas plays for IHS Market. So we've got a uh, a terrific team of financial analysts uh, who are going to try to answer this question that's intrigued everybody that's been looking at shale, which is, is, is anybody making money doing this? <laughs> uh, and uh, looking at stock performance for the past year, uh, there's a, a lot of skepticism in the financial community over this model Right, so now before I, uh, I turn it over to Jan, uh, I, I just uh, want to note uh, that Guy Caruso, who was the EIA administrator uh, from 2002 to 2008, was not responsible for that forecast that <laughs> Bob put up there. And I didn't get there until 2012, so that wasn't my forecast either. So you know that old phrase, uh, you know, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax that person behind the tree. It was really Richard Newell up at RFF <laughs> that made that terrible forecast. And since he's not here to defend himself, it's just perfect. I, I got to tell you that, that, uh, that making forecasts like that is really hard. And you know, these guys do this for a living. So let me just tell you one, one really quick story. Uh, so I get the EIA, and we're still having problems with the shale oil forecast. So uh, I got there in June of 2012. The 2013 annual energy outlook was already done. I mean, the models were run. The results were out. I, could, I had nothing. You know, I couldn't make any changes in, in any of that. It was just going to get published in December. So we published it in December, and the shale forecast was already a half a million barrels a day too low for 2013. So I call everybody in and I say, uh, you know, and, there, and Howard was there. Howard, I know Howard was standing here earlier. Uh, and, and they were expecting me and Howard to really yell at him, like, you know, like, what is, what's wrong with you people? How can you possibly do this? And, and I just called everybody in. I said, listen, I've worked on Wall Street for a long time. And I made lots of forecasts. And I was wrong a lot, you know, like on Wall Street, like you're really good if you're right 55 or 60% of the time, right? So I was wrong a lot. And they looked at me, they were shocked. And I said, but I had a pretty good career on Wall Street. And I, and I had, a, had a kind of a method. And the method was, don't be wrong right away. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to be wrong, you know, like, five years from now, like just don't be wrong immediately where people can put the slide up and show you how bad you were. All right, so with that in mind and uh, how hard forecasting is, uh, Jan is uh, going to lead us through his views of the financial appetite for investors in U.S. shale. Jan? Thank you, Adam. Uh, I used to think that forecasting was a little bit like baseball. If you hit above 300, you're sort of okay. Uh, I do agree that you don't want to F it up right in the beginning. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Frank. 
thank you, Sarah, uh, for bringing me over here again. Uh, and let me set the record straight, because I did not give uh, my bio, and I'm uh, misidentified. I wish I had something to do with socially responsible investing. That's my ambition. That's also the buy side. It's a shop that's run by a very good friend of mine, Erica Karp. Uh, Cornerstone clearly is not a very uh, unusual name. Uh, so where our Cornerstone uh, macro research uh, comes from is from one of the partners, uh, Andy LaPerriere, uh, who is here in DC, and his favorite charity is Cornerstone. It's a Christian charity, and it deals with education. Uh, and he was very uh, keen on that name. Uh, Andy is one of four partners in Cornerstone Research. We are a very, very small group. I came from a background of 60,000 people in a place called Credit Suisse. Uh, now we are 60. Uh, Andy is one of four. Uh, he does policy in Washington. He's one of the few people that I know. Uh, mind you, I live in Brooklyn, so I'm not very privileged in that regard. Uh, one of the very few people that I know that can make sense out of the current White House and the current constituency on the, on the Hill and what comes out of all of that. Uh, both domestically and in foreign policy. He does policy for us. Uh, we have Roberto Perley, also here in DC, uh, that does currency and rates for us. Uh, the key partner, managing partner, uh, in New York is uh, Francois Trahan, uh, a guy from French Quebec uh, that actually is the best strategist on the street, uh, bar none. In the last five years, he was a number one in II uh, for uh, those five years. And then, uh, of, con of course, uh, Nancy Lazard, uh, that does our macroeconomic work and with whom uh, uh, I ally myself because she looks at the macro much the same way that I look at the macro, and that is through the micro. Uh, look at everything in insane uh, detail. Now, all of that is a preamble to uh, when my slides are up, uh, I can show you uh, that my macro view of oil, um, how do I get the slides up, Adam? How do I get the slides up? Because hmm. what I wanted to uh, show is that I call my slides uh, triangulating uh, the business opportunity for shale, right? And then figuring out whether there clearly is a business opportunity. Oh, bingo, yeah, there you go. Uh, triangulating uh, the business of US shale. And what that really wants to say, uh, my referencing those four partners of mine, uh, wants to underscore that all the errors in the macro forecasting that I do are mine. They're not my partners, I just up front. They help me and I make the errors. Uh, I call this a profitable growth story. Uh, part of that is because I also have the pleasure to work with Ed Westlake, uh, who does what you came here to hear, uh, to hear about, uh, which is uh, figuring out how the companies are doing and how they are going to, how they are going to do a lot better than they did. Uh, the short answer to Adam's question is, uh, these companies have not made money. There's a promise that they will. And we are this close now, Ed says, and indeed the third and the fourth quarter showed that many of them are actually now beginning to make money properly doing shale as a business. Uh, so what am I talking about? I'm talking uh, not about the 38 slides that I gave you, uh, Adam. I have seven pages of Ed's disclaimers in here, uh, and I have uh, way too many macro slides, but they will get onto the uh, onto the website. Uh, I will only talk to seven and seven, so 14 slides, Adam, and I have my clock. Uh, I will stay between 15 and 20 minutes, and you will hopefully owe me a beer. So uh, what this uh, macro view is all about uh, is that I think, we think, that on the basis of this granular work that we do on the global situation of demand and supply, we have a pretty good idea what the balances are. Uh, and the balances are now in a supply deficit. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, why do we think that our balances are good? Is because our balances implied inventories match roughly over time, that is within a year, uh, our reported inventories globally. And we like to look at all, import, uh, all inventories every which where. Uh, that's what the upper left-hand slide uh, uh, chart wants to show you. And then, of course, we think that there was a very good reason why the regime last year changed. And I mean with that, the futures price regime changed. And that's because we went below demand cover on a global basis, below the five-year average of demand cover uh, in the middle of last year, which is not coincidentally why and where the bottom right-hand side wants to show you what is the spread between the front contract and the six month out contract. That's when the Brent market went into backwardation and from there the Brent market stayed in backwardation. So we are in a tightening uh, oil market fundamental, sorry, in a tightening set, we have a tightening set of fundamentals underneath this oil market. We now need supply growth to catch up 
uh, with demand, which continues to grow. Uh, and this is also my most important indicator, the one on the bottom right, is that backwardation chart. If that suddenly turns into a contango sometime after uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, I think my view will be wrong. Uh, as it stands, we thought that last year there was a 700,000 barrel a day uh, deficit globally, and from there we now need to grow supply out of a hole. Uh, up front, we do our own shale model work, uh, and we have raised that for everything else. Uh, around the world because I no longer have a global equities team. Uh, in our own shale model work, uh, we come in a $60 oil environment to exactly the same numbers as you do uh, which, uh, with the cube on North America, uh, which is one way to brag that we maybe know a little bit of what we're talking about and that would be mostly ads work uh, on the shale. What I really want to show you is uh, on slide nine, Adam, witness that I'm going through these slides very, very fast. Uh, here's a slide number eight. Uh, this wants to show bottom right-hand side that everything, in my opinion, is a cycle. Uh, so a high bar or a positive bar is an inventory build. Uh, at the end of the year, you have a little dot. You end the year in a surplus or in a deficit. Uh, we think we ended, or we will end, 18 in a deficit, further deficit, relative to normal. Uh, prices this year should stay above normal. Normal to us is 60 bucks. Normal is 60 bucks because in the, in the long run, which is five years out to me, uh, short run will be tomorrow. Uh, the long run, we think uh, $60, everything works. Economies work, Middle East works. Maybe not Venezuela, but for sure the shale works. Uh, and we don't invite enough inflation so as to derail the economy or to uh, send uh, uh, shivers up the spine of a German central banker. So uh, we like 60 bucks. Everything above that is super normal. This year is super normal. Next year is probably more normal. We go into a recession probably in 2020. We get an inventory built. And then the big question is, can the shale plus OPEC plus new FID get us to a balanced market again. In our base case, we do not. In 2022, we need higher, we need FIDs to make the math work for 2022, and that's why we think the back end of the curve needs to come up. Uh, these are different ways to paint that circle, so when you see these slides on the website, you know what they're talking about. It's our medium-term scenarios. What all of this wants to add up to, by the way, is uh, that we think we need a slightly higher long dated price, uh, call it Brent 36, which is still hovering below 60 bucks. Uh, we think that at the current price, plus a slightly higher longer price, the business of shale is fantastic and is, quite frankly, the place to be. Uh, there is tons of risk. This is our representation of risk. So Adam pointed out, I am in the forecasting business, plus I'm going to be wrong. This is how I'm going to be wrong. Uh, you can read this for yourself. There are risks that pertain to the very short run, that torque, if you will, the shape of the front of the curve. And then there are risks at the back end, back end of the curve. If the German industrial, industrial policy plus China's battery technology gets us one third of new car sales in 2022 being fully electric, the long data price of the curve does not need to come up. I think those are very large ifs. Uh, and I think, in fact, that we still underestimate quite how much uh, oil uh, the emerging markets will absorb. So there is, in other words, room to grow for the U.S. shale. I then went through a whole long litany of natural gas slides. I will save you those. Basically, in our view, natural gas is free. Uh, and it also means, uh, by the way, that if there is that room to grow, and if at 50 bucks these companies can make money and are now consolidating, United States crude oil production is going to go uh, uh, to the moon, uh, through the roof, whatever you want to call it, but up. Uh, we have, like I said, a similar target, something like 2 million barrels a day of growth this year and next, and year and year, uh, and then some significant amount of growth uh, in the NGLs count as well. Uh, our forecasts historically have not been that great, but our model now is a ton better, and at Westlake and his financials, company financials, get to drive it. So hopefully the outcome uh, is better. Um, what else did I want to show you is uh, that uh, in numbers, that we do agree with much of what was said in the earlier panel. This chart of uh, U.S. shale production at $60 shows you in cornerstone green that we get to uh, crude oil from shale above 8 million barrels a day at the end of 19. Uh, give me 65 and maybe I don't understand the restraints well enough, but I get the red outcome. 
and that is close to 10 million barrels a day. Uh, that's how sensitive we think a cash flow recycling model of shale uh, is or how sensitive the industry is. The industry is, uh, these are the numbers in the bottom uh, left hand side, the industry is now undergoing uh, a period of inflation. Macro wise there is inflation. People like me will always get the inflation targets wrong. Uh, I suspect that Ed gets them wrong too. Uh, he is budgeting for 17% uh, downhaul, uh, sorry, complete drilling and completion costs of well inflation this year with 25% of that, sorry, which is basically 25% downhole. Um, now, Who the Is Alice is uh, a song in the 1980s. Uh, Alice is our model. Alice is Ed's algo. He actually has an abbreviation for this, but what, what Ed did was when we joined Cornerstone Macro, he said, how do I differentiate myself as an equities analyst of a dying industry? Well, sorry, he didn't say dying industry. We don't think it's dying. Uh, of oil, right? Um, and he said, I got to be better than anybody else at not individual companies, not individual managements, not individual anything. I got to be better at big data and making connections. So what he did in his spare time uh, with a colleague, Chandra Menega, is design and develop basic company models of 82 companies in four industrial energy sectors. Integrated, refiners, service companies, and 42 American EMP companies. And then he factor ranks them into quintiles. And he did this with data that he backtested and sanitized all the way back to January 2010. And that gives you the ability to run scenarios for a particular company on its financials in, let's say, January 2011 and that time frame, and then run forward what would the outcome have been. He tested what are the most important uh, factors that decide whether a company is going to perform well or not so well. Uh, this is clearly not a great sector to have been in since uh, the beginning of this chart. What is purple is refiners. Uh, I yawn when people point out that refiners are great. Dark blue is the EMP. That's a different way for saying what Adam said. These things ain't making money and people don't like them, right? Um, that would be the short answer to why investors don't care. Um, Francois points out that the United States equities market, which will be a source of funding for this industry if they get it right, uh, is not exactly in the mood right now to be uh, doing something contrarian, like invest in energy, like what apparently they were with great foresight in the mood for in January 2016. I'd point out that in January 2016, very few people were in the mood for doing something with energy, and you would have to have been very, very contrarian. But now we are in a growth plus, eventually later this year, stability phase of what the equity market is likely to reward. Uh, I would posit, perhaps I'm crazy, that the EMP companies with oil in the Permian are going to fit that bill. This is how we approach, or rather how Ed and Chandra approach the sector. Insane detail. Uh, we talked earlier today about type curves. We have type curves down to the sub-basin uh, and uh, our friend from Rystad and I, we got to talk about where we get our data from because we don't have the fourth quarter data yet, but uh, so I am jealous to a degree, but uh, we do have a sick ton of data uh, here. And we draw, similar to all of you, uh, this very simple argument. The rocks aren't getting better, but there are a ridiculous amount of very, very good rocks, and the companies are getting better at getting the oil out. Whether it's efficiency or productivity gains, it's both in many places. All right. Uh, that's what those type cars want to show. Here is an example of uh, Pioneer uh, and Ed's work. What we are able to show is that on current financials with the current asset base, these guys have almost as much growth potential as they had in early 2014 when oil was 100 bucks. And that's a really, really big deal. Uh, so these guys are uh, going to be able to deliver growth uh, they are also, we think, uh, reducing their costs. Uh, this is a chart on the bottom right of uh, fully adjusted costs 
uh, wanting to show you the efficiency gain of, again, in this case, uh, Pioneer. Uh, this is how the balance sheets are improving, right? You can do this on different me measures. Uh, green going down is a good thing. And since the early part of 2016, when these things looked not like a very good investment, indeed, when, when I was at Credit Suisse, high yield was the topic of the day, uh, since then, balance sheets have cleaned up massively for the sector as a whole. Uh, what has improved uh, on the upper right-hand side, if I could only pick one slide uh, or one picture, it is this. Red, kind of intuitively, is revenue. Green, kind of intuitively, is uh, your costs, proxies of. These things are about to get profitable. Uh, now, we can talk later, perhaps, in the question and answer about whether the leopard has changed his spots or whether our friends down in Texas are no longer cowboys or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but the corner office, the shareholders, and the boards of directors have all uh, uh, changed, at the very least, their tune. Uh, now, what does all of that mean when you do it the way that we do it? Uh, this is the forced ranking in quintiles of 42 E&P companies. Uh, it should not be much of a surprise uh, that on the left-hand side, in green, and in the bottom uh, and in the blue side, where you find 17 E&P companies, 12 of those are Permian companies. Right? Uh, there is one backend. There is one DJ Basin company uh, in the top three. And there's one diversified company there as well. On the far right, those are gas-oriented EMP companies. Gas is not great. We all know that we are, ourselves, on a macro level, bearish gas. Uh, and we change the ranking as the data change. You see here uh, the ranking in the middle of the winter, when it wasn't clear that gas was really going to suck as bad as it now is, uh, some of these gas companies did a little bit better. Um, when it wasn't clear that some of these Permian guys were actually beginning to make money, some of the Permian guys didn't do quite so good or so well. Uh, so this changes. Alice changes her mind, if you will, uh, without input from Ed, uh, along these four factors. Net asset value, balance sheet, return on reinvested dollar, and then the debt adjusted production per capita. Uh, we haven't figured out how to uh, uh, handicap for really lousy or really great management, but we'll do that too. Uh, the ent enterprise is called Wonderland Analytics. That's the uh, LLC that Ed and I run. Uh, I am, perhaps no surprise, uh, the Mad Hatter in that outfit, and I haven't got an algorithm yet. Uh, and Ed is, uh, well, no, he isn't quite Alice, but Alice is his darling. Uh, and this will change. Uh, this is one different way for looking at the space. This wants to argue several things, I would argue. Uh, number one, these things are about to turn into proper, um, proper businesses, making money, uh, reinvesting dollars into a very, very large resource base. There is an insane inventory of good uh, wells, and that's before we get to secondary recovery, right? Uh, I would also argue from a big picture perspective, this industry has begun to consolidate. Uh, we are moving beyond just doing asset deals. Uh, we haven't really done corporate takeovers, uh, but the majors are moving in and uh, companies are beginning to sing uh, uh, from a hymn sheet uh, that advocates uh, returns on capitals being, uh, return on capital being distributed rather than plowed into the ground. Um, they are going to grow. Uh, there are, I believe, uh, huge premiums on technological development, but, uh, and not all that many constraints. Uh, I think that in the fullness of time, or let's say two years, the industry finds a way to uh, invest right through all the bottlenecks, or just simply redeploys capital. Uh, it will grow, it will make money, uh, and uh, we think, dare I say it, there is value. Now, in all of these things, one more time, uh, I am translating Ed's work. So if I made a mistake, that's my mistake, not Ed's mistake. He has a ton of detail behind all of this. Uh, we can talk about one or two individual companies, although I'd rather not. Uh, and with all of that, Adam, I think I'm at minute 19. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, we uh, had a bet. I'm not sure who won the bet about whether Jan could do 30 slides in less than 15 minutes. That was very good. Paul?
Thank you, uh, Jan, Adam, everyone for being here. Um, when I uh, tell us about that selfie, I will. <laughs> That's the whole presentation. Um, I, uh, Adam didn't mention, but I started originally at the IEA in 1990 uh, out of uh, college, and uh, I was a history and economics graduate. Um, my, uh, the reason I joined the IEA was that my godfather's brother was head of statistics, and uh, he said that we always need people. I didn't know anything about oil or statistics, but I showed up mid 1990s right around uh, the Gulf War I. Uh, I believe Guy, were you in charge then? Yeah, Guy Caruso was in charge, and um, they said, go and sit in that office over there. So I walked in and there was this kind of grumpy Dutch guy sitting there who barely acknowledged my uh, entering the room. And I thought, this is going to be fun. It was called uh, Jan Stewart. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's been a long, a long ride, but, but here we are again. Um, the selfie that Adam asked me about was actually, I'm very glad he, he asked me to talk about it, because I was originally going to show uh, a, 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 a picture to mock Adam. I always mocked Adam because he's a good-looking guy, but his photo was always at least 20 years old. And, uh, you know, there would be the Adam Siminski photo, and it would be sort of taken in 1995. And uh, I was looking for some sort of play on that, and I really couldn't find anything in time. So I actually just took my LinkedIn picture. Uh, Adam's not the worst offender for using an old photo, and you can obviously know if you know anything about oil that that's an old photo. I, when I first met Feridun Fesharaki, I was uh, stunned that he wasn't a 32-year-old. Um, I think his photo was from the high, uh, the high school year. But, um, Wall Street's very dynamic, and we're, we're under a lot of pressure uh, for a lot of reasons. And uh, this is actually my LinkedIn profile photo. Uh, and I would encourage you, implying that I might be changing jobs, uh, to use my LinkedIn if you want to get hold of me. And of course, for those of you who don't know, the photo is a tribute to the, uh, the great Christophe de Marjorie. That's him on the right. That's not me. Um, a wonderful man who I, I'm always like to say was the first oil CEO I ever got drunk with. Um, and of course, as you probably know, he was uh, tragically killed uh, in mysterious circumstances somewhat in, uh, in Moscow taking off uh, in, on a private plane that was apparently hit by a, a drunken snowplow driver, uh, which I think probably is what happened. But the conspiracy theory is that uh, Demarjorie's support uh, for the Russians and maybe something to do with currencies uh, was, was the reason why he was killed by the CIA. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But um, the long and short of it is that's the background to that story, a photo of me and Christoph, the CEO, former CEO of Total. So what do I do? I'm a stock analyst on Wall Street, and I was very interested to hear uh, the EOG example given uh, in the earlier panel uh, as an example of what I do and to make it uh, sound a bit more perhaps glamorous and, and challenging than it is. The, the news that EOG was using it, gas in enhanced oil recovery in the Eagleford uh, was interesting for a number of reasons as a stock analyst. The first thing is that EOG reports its results after the market. Uh, and uh, I think it was Q2 last year. We get the press release, let's say, you know, sometime after four, typically around five o'clock, and they announced that they uh, were using gas and in well, it, gas in enhanced oil recovery in the Eagleford had been for two years, and were achieving the kind of percentage upgrade uh, numbers that were cited. You know, was it 10, 15, 20 percent? improvement in performance, but they announced essentially they believed that the process was successful um, in that press release after the market. What happens to us is we then have to try and work out what that's worth to the stock price of EOG before 9.30 next morning. And the stock will start trading, given the credibility of EOG and the technical credibility of EOG, the stock will start trading on that news break. And of course, we basically don't have a clue. So we all start asking each other, you know, what does this mean? How can we work this out? What's the value per share? But the market, as of 9.30 the next morning, will start reflecting that. And I think that the, the main picture here, and I want to go very high level, is that what I've come to learn over the course of many years now do, on the sell side and having to react to these news stories, especially covering oil, is the wisdom of the crowd, that the market is unbelievably accurate at uh, capturing news flow and pricing and discounting uh, real value over time, and no less than any sector in oil. 
And you know, one of the jobs that Jan and I did, uh, whatever it is, 28 years ago, was very fortunate for both of us in my, my perspective, was that we were given the job of uh, developing the first database of non-OECD oil statistics. And uh, we did the first, with our boss, did the first green book, this green book of non-OECD oil and gas statistics. And I was only joking with Adam earlier this morning uh, that the, the problem was that we actually had no data. And especially on the demand side, the net result of what we did is we made it all up. And so whilst we had very good data for strange places like Venezuela back then and South Korea, we also didn't have any numbers for Africa. And it's really about the demand side of the equation. And so essentially we filled in the database uh, as best we could. And as I joked with Adam, I was concentrating when I did Albania, but by the time I got to Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Zaire, I wasn't paying so much attention. And what's so important about that is over the years, uh, the driver of the oil market has been emerging markets, and of course the inaccuracy in the data has only grown at the same time as it's in, been improved. But what it tells you is there's immense uncertainty uh, around all of this stuff, and that the only good number in the oil market is the oil price, has been a long-standing line of mine. And also that you have to derive in terms of, for example, the reaction of EOG's share price, what is the market telling me? So hundreds of times you'll hear people come in and say, oh, I've got my spreadsheet says there's plenty of oil supply, there's not enough oil demand, therefore the oil price should be 20, and the market's wrong. What the market tells you is should be how you derive your spreadsheet. And of course it's a circular reference. But that's important in terms of what I'm gonna to say to you, and what I think is a big hole from a financial perspective in how people look at this stuff. Uh, how do I change the page? In? That's gone wrong. Okay, so um, if you, I won't give you a basic finance lesson, I'm no person to do that, but the essence of valuing an equity is something along the lines of the present value of the future free cash flow. Uh, stated another way, if you think about it, returns over the cost of capital uh, plus growth. Uh, most simply put, if you think about returns over the cost of capital, that represents uh, earnings over price, the reciprocal being price earnings, which is obviously uh, the easiest of all uh, the calculations in terms of what a stock is actually uh, pricing versus its share price. And um, it becomes you know, very, very simple, and people have to retain that thought in terms of how you look at what the market's telling you about value. And uh, in that regard, I think the single biggest thing I want you to take away from what I'm going to say would be people spend far too little time thinking about the cost of capital. And that becomes a very important aspect of how you look at value. And so what you'll hear time and time again is people arguing about the oil price and arguing about how much will volume will be produced and where costs will go. Essentially, 99% of their time is spent thinking about returns, quite rightly, but very little indeed, if ever is spent talking about cost of capital. In fact, a former colleague of mine with Adam would always joke about how in the big oil companies they didn't spend enough time thinking about oil price outlooks. They, they, they essentially took an oil price and made a strategy. I think, again, many people just simply don't spend anything like enough time thinking about the cost of capital. And you can see that very clearly, in my opinion, in current markets, uh, where you've seen, uh, you know, obviously the classic oil companies suffering very badly, as I'll show you a sec in a second. But also you've seen the emergence, and for me, some very lazy thoughts about the difference, for example, in valuation between Tesla and Ford, um, which would be simply that Tesla is going to sell, is currently selling you know, a few thousand vehicles, Ford's selling many millions, but Tesla is far more valuable. The market's stupid. But at a given level, what the market's telling you is there's a guy called Elon Musk, who's arguably a genius, and if you think about it, ultimately the market is financing Mars exploration. And so what's the implied cost of capital and time frame of Mars exploration when you think about the Permian? And people don't spend enough time in thinking, what is the market telling me? You know, not, they generally would say, is that the market is wrong. And by the same token, very, very visible as well, uh, would be Walmart, Amazon, and Blue Origin as the, uh, is the Bezos space exploration vehicle, which essentially is financed from his pocket. And again, if you think about what the market's saying of relative valuation in terms of Amazon, uh, it's very important as to what the market's saying about the future. I've always maintained that there was no internet bubble, for example. Uh, if you look back to Amazon's share price at the peak of the bubble in 1999, it was 100 bucks, and the market cap was 40. You should have bought it, because ultimately, 
where we're at today is 1,500 bucks at a 700 billion market cap, which are also significant insofar as these are companies of the scale that we've simply never seen before. Exxon at peak was $450 billion in market cap with what people thought was a very implied low cost of capital. You should have sold it. GE was the same size at the time, right before the financial crisis. So you really have to think about what is the market telling us in terms of the price signals it's sending us as how you think about the future of Shell uh, output growth. In fact, you've kind of all got the cart before the horse is what I'm saying. How long have I got? <laughs> Ten? Ten minutes. Yeah. Um, so that's just sort of a backdrop of, of ways to think about something. And I'll, I'll throw one in there while it's on the top of my mind. Why would refining, if the market long term is very scared of Tesla and is selling oil stocks, in fact, we can move on to the next, shit, the next slide to show you. It's going backwards again. So all of that is a preamble towards showing you the relative performance of the oil stocks to the oil price and how dreadful it's been. Absolutely staggering. It's been an awful year for us on Wall Street, not only as generalists, but also as oil specialists, really the worst year we've ever had, essentially because of the disastrous loss of market share oil has had in what has been, as you know, an extremely strong stock market. And that's been doubly dispiriting for us as oil analysts, because you can see here with red being uh, uh, WTI and green being Brent and black being the relative performance of oils to the S&P, that includes Exxon and Chevron, that black line, in the XLE ETF. You can see we've had an absolutely disastrous relative performance. And it, it seems that every time this happens, it also comes from a relatively optimistic start to the year. So as I have told you, essentially the thing to do is to try and understand why is the market sending that signal to us? Um, you know, and why is it being so powerful? And within that, very interestingly, why would the refiners of all things be the best performing sector? Because, of course, you would have thought that if the market is selling the oils based on the future of uh, oil being doomed as a result of Tesla, refining would be the worst thing to own. And, of course, I think what the market's telling you is, in fact, that the oil sector is doomed, but the refiner's strategy of high cash return to shareholders makes the long term irrelevant. So, essentially, what you'll find with the refining stock is a high dividend. If you'd bought Valero at the beginning of 2017, the implied yield was probably 8% if you combine the dividend plus the buyback. That 8% cash return to you annually means that essentially the equity that you buy at, the, let's say, beginning of 17 is fully paid back to you within 10 years, and you don't care about Tesla. <clears throat> and it's very important for shale strategy because essentially the shale strategy has been to grow and to grow and to grow basically on the idea that oil prices will be higher in the future, or that you sell the company by growing it to Exxon. Because the great success stories of US EMP, the Burlingtons and the XTOs, sold themselves ultimately to what we would call the greater fool. And the greater fool model was essentially driven by the idea of resource shortage and higher prices in the future, and the fact that you proved up your resources, and then you sold it to the greater fool, and that was the key reason that you said that US EMP companies were not wrongly valued, even though they never made a return because of that fundamental combination of higher price in the future and ability to sell to a group, presumably a greater fool. And I think what happened during the course of 2017 is that model broke down totally. And hence, the sector was absolutely appalling. And we saw an unprecedented number of uh, essentially funds shut down, clients being fired, and everything else. I would add that there's a technicality in this because markets are not perfect, which was that oil ended up being heavily, heavily concentrated in value indexes and almost unrepresented in growth indexes. And I think unless you were a, a Wall Street professional or, or, or looked at this very closely, you'd be unaware of that. The Russell 1000, which is a typical benchmark for investors, was shifted to less than 1% oil represented on the growth side in mid-2016. And growth has been the driving force of the market. And so oils have not participated because money has poured in on a momentum basis into, into, into growth indexes, and oil simply isn't part of it. There's very few stocks, no oil service companies, no refiners form part of that index. And on the value side, we went from about, uh, I think, 7% to about 14% oil represented 
within the Russell 1000, and it's been Valley that struggled, and most people just simply wouldn't know that, which is why I highlight it. I was joking with Adam, and I didn't get the slide in here, that I wanted to show a picture which was recently a viral amongst guys that do what I do, which was called Wall Street Traders React to Recent Market Turmoil, and it was a photo of a bank of servers. Because the, the other aspect here, of course, is that we're in a momentum market driven by uh, electronic trading and quant trading, which again is why the value and, and growth aspects of indexes is so important. All right, let's keep going. Adam's giving me the get off the stage sign. I'm going backwards really quickly here as well. I've lost, I've lost at least two minutes. What the hell am I doing? Am I going backwards again? Yeah, I am. I'm going, I'm in the wrong prison. How do I go forward? Oh, I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was an up and down button. Do I get extra time for that? Okay, so let's just get a little bit more specific on oil. Um, okay, so, so the, key, the key issue here ultimately, which I said to you, is that the, the market has shifted uh, from, I believe, a view of resource shortage in the future. So essentially, if I, if I go back to the 2000s, well, everywhere I went when we had such a great run in oil, it was peak oil, it was the end of the oil age, it was Matt Simmons. Uh, you know, you could see all the airport books were about the end of the oil age and, and how we were doomed in terms of oil supply and we had, you know, oil prices would be higher in the future and we were all doomed and of course that was completely wrong. Uh, and luckily we were right on, on why, because essentially we said you can crush coal at $150 a barrel, so you'll never be short oil. So the whole ultimate recoverable resource idea was, faith, uh, was wrong. But more recently, if you think about it, what we've gone into is a, is a view where ultimately there is no resource limitation, because with shale, ultimately we can recover as much of it as we want, one way or the other. And that has led ultimately to the view literally that we no longer look at F in the F and D cost. If you think about it, we used to think hard about F and D cost. There is no F cost anymore. It's all D cost, development costs, and that's huge. And by the same token, what you'll see is that the backwardation of the curve has all, was massively altered the way you have to look at future investment because ultimately you no longer can depend on higher prices in the future. And the net result has been that we're now forcing the companies to stop growth or stop pursuing growth relentlessly once they get to a given scale, and we're not sure what that scale is, because they can no longer depend on higher prices in the future. And so what we've developed, we think, with what we call the renaissance, is, is my tag for this whole theme, that we are shifting the EMP business uh, away from growth for growth's sake into a actual cash return business, and we demand a 10% plus cash return to shareholders, that's dividend plus buyback plus uh, growth in the two, as our return, and there's very few companies that meet that, although there are several that can. A currently covered, I would say, Suncor can in heavy oil sands. None of the EMP companies are currently offering that kind of return, but they do have the potential to offer that. And several, such as Pioneer here in the room, Devon are actually promising that over the next three years. So we're going into a real cash return model, which will mean less investment and more attention to return to shareholders. Just my final point, we invited a private equity investor to join one of our uh, presentations recently. And what he said was, look, as a private equity manager, I have to make 2% just to cover my fees and 8% cost of capital. And you can debate that, as I said. But essentially, uh, the 8% cost of capital means I need to get more than 10% actual return to make money. I have the same assets, and I do make that money. And I'm in the same asset in the, as EMPs. And the reason these companies don't make that money is essentially because they're paid wrong. The CEOs are incentivized essentially based on growth. And the growth element of that is based on the idea that oil prices will be higher in the future. So the reason that they pursue growth is because it's a proxy for returns if you have higher oil prices in the future. They have to change their pay structures to recognize actual returns. And I will say that part of the sell down that we've had in the oil sector relative has raised the cost of capital and has also got shareholders demanding that pay structures change, and they will. As we see pay structures change, you'll see a lot more capital discipline, a lot more cash return uh, to shareholders, and that will be a, a strong positive for the sector. There's one final point I want to make on cost of capital, which is just this slide. The, I forgot this one, so I'm adding it as, as my final final. The cost of capital in US EMP is highly significant because if you look at the three Gs of risk, which is geology, geography, and geopolitics, which set the cost of capital, the Permian has a unique low cost of capital. 
essentially the geology we've talked about, there is no F cost. The geography, as you know, we're in Texas with a very stable geopolitics, which is not only the fact that you're defended by the Sixth Fleet or whatever it is, but uh, the fact that your fiscal regime is highly stable. As a result, we've argued that a company like EOG or any Permian player isn't actually expensive on its multiple if the multiple is set by its returns over the cost of capital because it has a far lower risk profile than, for example, Hess in Guyana. And as a result, you have to think very hard about why people invest in the Permian so willingly, despite what looks like a relatively constrained return outlook, as opposed to why Hess, in theory, looks so cheap. And it's because of this uniquely low risk that we see here in the US. So, so keep that in mind. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good morning. My name is Roger Diwan. I'm the third panelist with an accent this morning in a row. <laughs> uh, that's what makes America great, correct? Uh, and we're not going to share uh, all the stories with uh, Jan, too. We, uh, we kind of started also at the same time after his uh, stint at the uh, IEA. Um, we were on, uh, on different walls in the same company uh, working the same balances. Um, what I'm trying to do today is really to talk about um, more structurally, how money has played a role in allowing this incredible uh, boom in, uh, in shale production. Um, if you would have been here a year ago and I would have told you uh, uh, WTI is going to average $51 in 2017, and I would have asked to make a forecast uh, how much we're going to grow uh, during 2017, I think the consensus was between 300, 400,000 barrel per day, maybe entry to exit in the United States. Well, we grew about 1.2 million barrel per day. So there is something happening here uh, which has to do more than oil prices uh, itself, and it has to do with what I would call the fuel, uh, which is uh, really uh, uh, pushing these uh, production in the United States, which is finance. Uh, there are a lot of words in this uh, slide, so you don't have to read it. I'll, I'll give you a few, uh, uh, a few, you know, key conclusion here is uh, the resource endowment in the United States in shale is really about the worst resources you can think, uh, think of. And what made it possible to produce it and to discover how to do it to get the, the, the right sauce, if you want, uh, the secret sauce to, to get it going, it's the availability of money and risk money. People are willing to try things to make it happen. Okay, And it's that merger of two industries in a way. Uh, the oil industry, which was resource poor on, on onshore in the United States, and the availability of risk capital, which made it happen. So it's, in a way, we're not looking at one industry, but two industry, and I think this panel is what it is about. Um, the financial sector in the United States is very wide, very sophisticated, and it means that different companies or different type of structures of companies in the United States can find different pockets to finance them. You have uh, money comes in all flavors and shape and form, and I'm going to show a little bit how different companies uh, are able to access it. Obviously, different uh, cost of capital, but the idea is th there is appetite for everything uh, uh, in the financial market. and. Um, it's kind of funny that uh, when uh, the financial sector is asking the uh, oil sector to be disciplined and the oil sector is asking the financial sector to be disciplined and how they give them money. But the idea is none of them are very disciplined at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> an important element, uh, and, and I think in the first panel we saw that, when you look at the break-evens, break-evens are around $40 now or maybe a little bit lower. So when we have a $51 price, that's a $10 margin, it's pretty good. It means at $60, you doubled your profit margin. Okay, so the difference between 50 and 60 and 65 is huge. It's not small. Uh, it's not small increment. Uh, and that makes a big difference. So to, to, uh, to go back to one of Jan's chart, at these small price difference, we have very large uh, change in outcomes. And that's what makes these uh, forecasts a lot more difficult. Uh, because prices do two things in a way. They not only change your cash flow, but they also change the amount you can borrow. Correct? So it's a multiplier. And I think uh, one thing you'll see through this presentation, prices is 
an input, the, the bigger input for us is really the total availability of capital, which is prices plus your ability to borrow. So total cash flow, how much you can invest, what's your total capex rather than what is the price is a key driver of, uh, of the way we forecast things. And at certain price threshold, capital become more abundant, correct? So it's not a linear relationship between price uh, and volume. At uh, $45, you don't have a lot of money. At 55, you have a lot more. At 65, you have a lot, lot more. So it's like a mushroom. <coughs> Um, there is money coming from many different sources and what are called non-traditional sources, non-bank institutions, private equity, etc. And there's still uh, a lot of money on, on the sides uh, capable of coming. And when you look at the needs of financing, it's not that large, actually, for the, for the total ENP sector in the United States. Um, to go next, uh, <coughs> really what we had here is... Um, I like to call Shield really the ultimate uh, uh, capitalist experience. So we all studied economics, but I think you haven't understood economics until you, you saw uh, 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 US uh, ENP working and how uh, um, money, ideas, and, and, and skills come together to create uh, value very quickly. Uh, and that's, that marriage is actually very strong. In our databases, and I think it's the same for Reichstag and Woodmac, when you look at the number of ENP companies which have these wells producing in our, all our, our numbers, we have 16,000 ENP companies in the United States. All right, maybe 12,000 have only one or two or three or five wells, but it means that actually you have more ENPs in this, in this company than you have McDonald's or Starbucks. I don't think people realize that. It's a very rich target environment. There's a lot of people who are willing to finance uh, oil and gas in the United States. Um, the share revolution have also come at a time when we had cheap money, uh, and I think the low interest rate has really helped that first phase of shale, which is how to discover and make it happen. So you needed risk capital, and risk capital at 0% uh, uh, interest rate is uh, much easier than uh, if you have higher interest rates. So the, the era of cheap money and the fact that a lot of global capital was, was looking for a place to go has really helped the development. And now we're in a cycle where you don't need as much risk money, correct? We're entering a very different phase in the shale development. We're really entering manufacturing. And uh, uh, manufacturing requires, obviously, you have uh, different uh, financial criteria for it, but also you need less money to borrow because uh, you have a very big cash flow. Um, th that sector has attracted a lot of capital. We'll come back to that. Um, and <clears throat> I wanted to show a little bit how capital is needed differently for different type of companies. So uh, I'm taking here the US uh, production, and I'm breaking it down not by basins, but really by the size of the companies. Uh, and just to show the structure of who produces uh, onshore North America. Um, well, the big gray part is the big ENPs, so the one you know, the EOGs, the Devons, etc. Uh, but you have actually 50% of the production, which is coming from somewhere else. Uh, about 15-20% uh, uh, coming from private uh, holders. So some of them are very small, but some of them are fairly large. Uh, you have another um, over 30% coming from small and medium ENPs. And you have a small portion of the majors, which is less than 10% right now, which will be growing uh, further. And what it tells us in a way that and if you do the same actually for the Permian, at two, uh, two different time uh, in history, what you see here is it's slightly changing, but not a lot. Uh, but the fact is that still the small ENPs and the privates and the medium represent still over 50% uh, of uh, the Permian right now at a time when it's growing very fast. So it's nice to focus on the big companies, but they only bring basically only half of the production. So a lot of it is happening in the tail, and that's where the marginal money tend to go. Um, I think the, the, the large companies, it's not very difficult to finance them. They have big operation and big cash flows. Uh, the question is how much uh, money goes to the more marginal, smaller producer or private uh, uh, holders. <coughs> that's the important chart. Sorry, I need to grab my water. And 
and I said that the key metrics we're looking at is um, how much deficit financing is available. So how much, basically, money uh, is available to, to drill new wells. As we know, uh, the uh, ENP's equation is pretty simple in the United States. Uh, they will drill with every dollar they have and with every dollar that they can borrow. Okay, that's disciplined. Um, that's what we, when, when we said they're disciplined, this is what they're doing, correct? They're drilling with, and now we want them to be really disciplined to drill with every dollar they have. Okay, um, so everything is relative. What's important is a certain uh, segment of the industry has had that very large deficit spending, especially this, uh, the small and the medium uh, companies. Uh, the large ENPs, uh, the one in green here, uh, have done better, obviously, in the early part of the cycle when they were uh, ramping up, they borrowed quite a lot, and we believe we're entering time of the cycle where actually they won't and they don't need that much, but that's still a 15 to 20 percent deficit spending here into this uh, 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 picture. So uh, <clears throat> overall, uh, this is an industry which is still going to be spending 120 percent uh, of cash flow and being disciplined. <clears throat> to go back quickly to these uh, the different companies, what you have here is, uh, is quite interesting. Uh, different companies get financed differently by different people. Uh, there is a large variety of, uh, of instruments available, uh, obviously different cost of capital, but everybody can find uh, uh, finan uh, financing especially at $60. At 45 a lot of these pockets are closed. At $60, most of them are, are open. Some of them are wide open. And when you look at uh, the cost of capital, obviously the cheapest way is to finance yourself from your operation. Uh, but it's a quite large uh, uh, spectrum of uh, instruments available, uh, <clears throat> and most of them still uh, available today. Take the, 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 the debt instrument, for example, uh, with uh, oil prices now a fraction of what you have. Uh, the high yield uh, are pretty much the same level when, uh, uh, when oil prices are at 120. So they're not paying, uh, if you want, a lot more when, uh, when prices are, were significantly higher and the crisis was pretty short in terms of the inability to finance during uh, uh, this period here. And this is pretty much the costlier way to get financed uh, in the US ENP. <clears throat> Private equity, uh, we still have uh, a, a lot of funds got uh, raised during the 2014-2017-2016 uh, uh, period, about uh, uh, $60 billion per year. Uh, not a lot got deployed, so you still have actually money on the sideline. Uh, the flavor changes, you know, uh, at one point everybody wants to, uh, to buy here uh, ENP, now everybody wants infrastructure and, uh, and midstream. Uh, that money is still available. Uh, you don't have large fundraise anymore, but you still have a very large capitalized um, uh, private equity, especially the generalist one. You have money coming from abroad to be invested into the, uh, into the sector. At the end of the day, uh, there's very few businesses like the oil and gas where you can invest in a private equity where within 12, 18 months you have pretty much a full return on your capital when you have asset producing within 120 days. If you think about it, uh, there's, n there's no industry where you can build a plant and have it functioning and running within 120 days and returning uh, cash flow that quickly. So uh, when you're looking at investment return in, in a three to five years, there's very little, very few industry, if any, which can compete with that, correct? So you still have plenty of investors looking for that. Um, when we also talk about 20% deficit spending, so let's say the, uh, the industry needs 100, uh, will generate $100 billion uh, this year and they need to borrow $20 billion. That $20 billion is really 
all the money coming outside of cash flow. So you need to think about it three ways. Um, it's what you can borrow, but it's also what's coming from within the companies. A company which is uh, drilling in uh, West Africa or in the Gulf of Mexico producing and reinvesting that, ca that capex in the onshore, that's deficit spending. Just to give you an example, we believe that this year we need about 20, 25 billion of deficit spending in the United States. But Chevron and uh, Exxon alone uh, will be will have probably cash flow in their uh, onshore operation in the three, three and a half billion dollar, but they announced nine billion dollar of, in, of investment. So it means that, you know, a quarter of the deficit spending will come from these two companies, uh, doesn't need to be borrowed. Um, I'm not going to go through the hedging part because I'm running out of time. I want to go here, which is really uh, when we look at <coughs> the amount of capex um, Avail spending uh, in the United States, we're saying it's uh, going to be a 20% increase between 2018 and 2017. A lot of people say, no, the industry is going to be very uh, disciplined, 20% is too much of an increase. We don't believe that that type of deficit is available uh, to be spent. And so the forecast of growing about a million barrels per day is not really uh, feasible. But when you look at the rate of spending exiting the year and where we believe the spending will be in, 20, uh, in 2018. Actually, it's about a 10% increase. So it's a very small jump from where we exited the year to where we're going, uh, uh, going forward. And for us, the way really to look at it is uh, take a price forecast and look at the total DNC, which is announced, and say, okay, how much at what price, how much deficit you get. So in a way, uh, where are we? And we're saying basically with the amount of uh, production hedge, you really would need to go under $45 now to have an impact on production in 2018. And at $55 basically, um, which is a realized price, uh, you can certainly uh, uh, finance the, the sector in, uh, in 2018 and 2019. And when you look at these forecasts, again, uh, for us, the key input is not prices, is really total capex. And uh, when you look at 2019 here, 2018 is pretty much baked. Uh, for 2019, uh, sm small changes, about 15% basically uh, in, uh, in activity, have tremendous impact on, on production. And the reason and in a way, what the previous panel uh, tried to do and uh, what we're trying to do here is to, to explain that when you're forecasting uh, uh, shales, and uh, I think uh, you guys did a great job looking at all the criteria from uh, the, the, the length to the amount of sand you're putting to the productivity changes, etc., cetera, a uh, small change in money actually have a tremendous impact. Um, <clears throat> And when you're uh, uh, doing a forecast, you're not forecasting if you're growing a million barrels per day, actually. What we're doing, and I think this is what these gentlemen are doing too, is we're, we're forecasting how much oil we're bringing online. And in the United States in 2018, we'll bring online by December 31st about 3.5 million barrels per day, correct? Not a million growth. 2.5 million will go to compensate for the decline, and a million goes to growth. So. Uh, <laughs> Small changes in, 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 in the money available and the number of wells we're drilling, let's say if we forecast 17,000 wells and we ended up for, uh, drilling 18,000 wells, uh, which is really in the realm of uh, our margin of error, that will give you a million and a half growth. So y your growth number could be wrong by 50%, but actually uh, it takes very small changes on the amount of capital uh, to make a change on, on, on that forecast. And I think this is uh, not as much appreciated. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, prices matter, and we see here, but in a $55, $65 uh, environment, you're into this 25 20% uh, uh, deficit financing, which is largely available between private equity, the majors coming in, and uh, uh, th uh, through the different instrument debt, and probably not equity raised at this stage. I don't think there is much appetite for that, uh, but there is plenty of appetite for the rest. Um, so I would like to stop here and really think 
through the two uh, panel we had um, that we need really to think some of the bigger input interest rates, the global macro, the availability of capital, and on the margins, that was going to make the U.S. growing at half a million barrel per day or a million and a half barrel per day, uh, not only just the, uh, the, the changes in productivity. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, this, we're supposed to run to 12.15. Maybe we can get another five minutes or so past that. That'll give us close to half an hour for Q&A. Uh, let me just uh, start with a, a question that maybe everybody could address here. Um, Paul, I was intrigued by your thought that you should have bought, you should have stayed with Amazon even, even in the midst of the the uh, downturn in the tech stocks in the year 2000 uh, because the long-term model made sense. It's possible, it seems possible to me, uh, that that might also uh, make sense for any companies that get involved in shale from the standpoint of, of if we know that oil prices are cyclical, uh, we get into the mode of thinking that whatever the current price is, is going to stay forever. And when it was 50, it was going to stay at 50 forever. But prices could go back up again, which would then make all of those investments uh, quite attractive. So what is the, is there a case for higher prices in the long term? Could GDP surprise to the upside and bring demand with it? Um, is auto fuel efficiency more important than the penetration of electric vehicles? And, and are the trends towards lower or uh, plateauing in fuel efficiency uh, rules, uh, perhaps here in the US, perhaps globally? Uh, could it drive a upside surprise uh, to demand? So then we end up with, well, yes, shale is there. Uh, and it's profitable, but it can't meet the entire growth in global demand over a five or 10 year period. And so prices respond positively to that. What do you think? Yeah, I think ultimately the question is demand long term. It's been a simple dynamic, which has been OECD efficiency uh, versus emerging market GDP and demography. And I believe our, our general view is that we're in a long plateau for demand. Uh, Ten years ago, I wrote we would never go. In fact, it was a line of demargeries. We would never go beyond 100 million barrel a day oil market. I think we'll be there within the next one or two years. Um, we're there. So uh, I think that people tend to underestimate World Bank data, for example, shows uh, 30 to 50 percent of Indians and Chinese still don't use any commercial energy and, and tend to overestimate the impact of Tesla. We do believe that Tesla and its equivalents, we do believe that on a 10-year view, there will be significant change in behavior regarding autos in the US, but not before then, which is why I was giving the example of Valero, that you've got about 10 years to play with here and you, get, you better get paid. Um, but generally speaking, I think the long term has always been that the 20th century was driven by oil and the 21st century will be driven by electricity. It's just that the 30-year transition is on and we're somewhere between years 5, 10, and 15, and I'm not sure exactly where we are with that, Adam. Generally speaking, sentiment in the market, in my opinion, uh, is that it's, it's too negative on oil demand uh, uh, and the oil demand outlook. So investors don't want to be caught if the music stops playing. Jan, what, uh, maybe Jan could uh, chime in with thoughts on what is it that could make investors have a more positive view of of the uh, the potential for earnings over time, you know, how do you how do you change the, the shares sell at different price earnings ratios? Investors are willing to pay more for some companies than they are others. What what is it that would generate excitement again in in uh, oil uh, stocks and oil equities? Baby steps. Uh, I think you need, as an industry, to demonstrate uh, that you can actually make money and return some of that to uh, shareholders. I think that Paul was absolutely spot on uh, in terms of what the difference is between refiners uh, and Texas E&Ps. 
and that is that they actually learned how to give money back to their uh, stakeholders. Um, flip side is that uh, the, the, the trend can bail you out, right? Uh, you've had a wonderful episode of, I don't know, pick a number, 10 years, during which we were taught and indoctrinated with the whole notion that it's going to be slow growth forever, macro-wise. Uh, I'm old enough to remember that growth was actually faster. And I think uh, very few people are wanting to entertain the notion, precisely to the point of your question, uh, that we are embarking globally uh, in an accelerating growth phase, on an accelerating growth. I mean, really strange things are happening. Uh, Japan's economy is clicking over positive like. Uh, Italy is doing actual structural reforms on how it runs its economy. France elected a president that 10 years ago wouldn't have had a chance in hell of getting elected. Uh, emerging markets are building infrastructure. Uh, I'm not for sure that I buy shares in the gas pipeline from Afghanistan to India, uh, but we are building roads in a place called India. Um, and there are 1.3 million billion people, uh, and that's an economy with a very, very large share, very young people, uh, around 700 million of whom have no toilets, right? Uh, so there's a fair amount of uh, uh, growth to go, almost commensurate with the uh, reservoir of shale oil in America, if you want to go that route. Uh, and that is before you begin to quantify uh, what already 10 years ago at UBS we used to call the other billion them that don't fall into the bucket of China or Brazil. Uh, I picked a fight with the guy who used, used to run uh, uh, BP's economic forecasting, I believe he works in Abu Dhabi now, uh, on precisely that point. So the, the, I uh, am with you that we might at, uh, at the very least entertain the notion uh, that you might get a little bit faster growth than you're used to, that it affects more people than you think it might, uh, that you will have both. Uh, the, uh, cities in Germany where you can legally no longer drive a diesel car, as per yesterday's decision, uh, that are going to be entirely electrified, uh, maybe even in Brooklyn, uh, if I may, never mind. Uh, and at the same time, you have German car manufacturers profitably selling shit tons of diesel cars all over Eastern Europe, or what we used to call Eastern Europe. So uh, I'm the optimist, uh, the immigrant, uh, the rosy colored, and I think that we can get a little bit of everything. Yeah, thank you. So, Roger, a quick question for you. You've been advising um, oil and gas companies for, for several decades. What are they asking you? I mean, rather than you giving them your advice, what are they asking you about? Then you can give your advice. What's the key question that they want to know the answer to these days? Well, it depends on the size of the company, obviously. Um, Look, in the U.S., for the U.S. Uh, ENPs, when you look at what they've done in, uh, in uh, entering 2018, the idea was they wanted to show discipline, so they uh, basically say, we will, uh, we will forecast our uh, uh, spending at around $55, $58. Okay, so they're all forecasted 55, 58, and at 55, 58, they'll grow. And guess what? They'll get 63, and they'll pay uh, shareholder back. So they're going to be able to grow a million barrels per day and pay shareholders. So that got bailed off again uh, this year. And, they, and, uh, and because now we're get, getting into this manufacturing process, and I think the US ENP will change quite a lot as you move into that manufacturing process where uh, it's about managing, as we said, logistics and cost. Uh, which is very different than uh, exploring for new shales. Uh, if you're in that price range, you're going to be consolidating, you're going to have these big basin players which can manage logistics and cost uh, and stay profitable and probably return money into that uh, to shareholders into that 50, 55, 65 dollars. But if you go beyond that in terms of prices, uh, you'll go back to the good old days. Let's go look for new shales. Let's uh, restate uh, uh, the, uh, the the playing field. So I think for for a lot of the U.S. companies is understanding the sustainability of these prices, uh, which goes back to demand to a certain degree. And I'll come back to what some of the larger companies are, are are asking. Um, and demand here uh, is difficult to be very 
negative. I mean, we had, uh, if you take uh, 2018, uh, 2014, 2018, this is as good as it gets in terms of uh, cumulative uh, uh, demand growth. I mean, uh, it's, I feel like it's peak, peak demand discussion right now uh, because we're growing as good as we can and pretty much as well as we have done in the last 100 years in terms of volumet volumetric growth over, over five years. I mean, we grew by about 8 million val per day. So uh, it hasn't peaked yet. <laughs> it, it's very far from peaking, actually. Actually, it's accelerating. I mean, the combination of accelerating growth and low prices do what it always does. It accelerates demand. And it's, as you said, we are having the OECD growing right now. I mean, forget about just the non-OECD, and we still have another leg, uh, potentially, with, with, the, with the producer. So demand is still uh, uh, going strong. I think the biggest question, to, 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 go, to go to your initial one, is really how that new global supply system works. When you have your traditional uh, barrels which take three to five years to come online and your exploration which takes five to seven years, so these uh, medium uh, uh, term barrels and your long cycle barrels, how you invest in them when you have completely changed the supply equation and the supply math by adding this to the, to the mix where you have one player which can go zero or plus one million any year depending on the price basically in the last three months of the year. So to do a five-year forecast of the U.S. shale, it's almost impossible because in year three, it really depends on the fourth quarter of year two to budget your year three. So if you are trying to put capital to, you know, invest in deep water uh, development or even exploration anywhere uh, in the world and forget about anything frontier, but even things that you know, how do you risk capital? So how do you uh, manage a portfolio where, you know, a, a large number of the most capitalized companies in the world for oil and gas have no shale, so they don't have access, if you want, to that uh, uh, short-term uh, fast cycle barrels. How they manage their portfolio, how they invest, uh, this whole issue of, uh, of FIDs, when they happen, how much, how much you're taking risk, what's your price, <clears throat> all of that is changing. And on, on top of them, they have to think about demand because we're talking about project five to 10 years down the road. The shale guys don't have to think uh, uh, about peak demand. They just have to think about next year. Do we have enough uh, Permian uh, 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 capacity to get the oil uh, somewhere on a ship? Okay. Um out in the audience here. Adam, I'd add to that, the, the, the perverse effect might be that you underinvest, that you, uh, I mean, I know certainly when I speak to my friends, the Saudis, they, they are worried about the lack of FIDs and that in fact, uh, you then see the oil price go very high and that you then change the demand picture. All right, I saw Herman had his hand up and didn't, hasn't asked a question yet. So uh, lots of black swans out there too while we wait for the microphone to come to Herman. Right here. Autonomous vehicles. Thank you. Blockchain. Herman Friends. Yuan based commodity pricing. Geopolitical <laughs> event. Are you ready to go now, Herman? <laughs> Herman Friends and International Energy Services. Um, and EIG. Uh, the question about capital. When capital becomes a constraint, because part of the story was cheap capital has made all this possible. But now we are beginning, we are basically uh, at. at a level of growth now that is likely to accelerate further in the United States, despite the tax cuts. But the tax cuts and deficit spending are creating a humongous deficit in the United States for years to come, a trillion plus. At the same time, we are beginning to attack our trading partners to cut their deficits with us, or their surpluses with us, so that they end up investing less in treasuries. So. At what point is uh, the combination of those factors going to lead to substantially higher interest rates, which could impair the kind of growth we have seen in the past? So trade wars, the end of cheap capital, interest rates rising, uh, does that spoil the, the party? Yeah. So. Um, I mean, higher interest rate will make it more difficult, especially for the, the, the smaller company who needs to really to, uh, uh, to borrow more money. But the shale is at a different stage 
than it was two, three years ago, where you, where you needed to throw a lot of money to acquire land to try things. Right now, I mean, think about it. Your cash flow this year is 1.2 million barrel per day higher to generate and $15 higher. So your need to financing are shrinking. Okay, so it it becomes that million barrel per day growth is sustainable in a higher uh, interest rate for the next two to three years, as long as you don't have degradation in the quality of the acreage and a tremendous increase on the cost. The industry really need to, to borrow or, or get something in, in the magnitude of 20 to $25 billion this year and next. When you look at the size and the depth of the financial market in the United States, it's not much. Okay, um, So it's available. The question comes, four or five years down the road when you need to go and find more shales, you have sweet spot exhaustion, uh, cost is starting to increase because your well count has to keep growing every year, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you have any prices go from 60 to 65 to 70, I don't think you'll, you'll, you'll hit that. Yeah, if I continue the uh, cost of capital point, the point really was that as the equities have gone down relative, the cost of capital has gone up effectively. And now, of course, what you have is rising yields. Uh, and so real, for example, dividends are not what they seem. And in fact, Jan's, one of the Jan slides, if it goes online, is, is very simply showing you uh, the, yield, uh, the yield that you get from these companies over time versus the oil price. Um, I think what I would add, uh, as well as a consideration to what you're asking, is the dollar and the impact on the dollar, because it seems that the recent strong sell-off in the dollar was related to that concern. And, you know, I think another thing that I'd add to my own slides on the low, the low cost of capital in the Permian is that it's dollar neutral. So previously, for example, Canadian heavy oil sands, we thought was a great investment as regards risk to the oil price uh, and the potential for oil prices to go up a lot. But if you saw the spike that occurred, for example, in uh, 2011 with the Arab Spring, uh, in prices going back to 120, the Canadian oil stand stocks didn't react to that. E the equities didn't because the Canadian dollar went up as fast as the oil price. And if you look at that same impact globally through the oil price downturn, you'll be very aware that not only can ca Canadian but also Brazilian, Australian, but particularly Russian production was highly resilient because the ruble collapsed, for example, in the case of Russia. So, you know, I wish I knew the answer to, to, to when the interest rate impact comes through because it's the secret to most things. Further to Adam's uh, comment, I have to say that I had lunch with a, with a Saudi uh, a couple of weeks ago and I, the meeting concluded with us deciding which website to buy Bitcoin from. And uh, true story. Right. I've, I personally want to get into the, the uh, Venezuelan petro market. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Janus. <laughs> Thank you. People tend to use the break-even price very loosely. Uh, there's a half cycle and full cycle, so we've heard that people are making money at $40. What is the real full cycle break-even cost for a couple of the uh, LTO basins? Certainly, the, as an equity analyst, we have lost tolerance with presenting wellhead IRR. That's now become known to be nonsense. And, and again, if these returns were anything like what they say in their presentations, uh, this sector wouldn't have behaved the way it did for the last year relative to the market. Again, a point that I can give you as a Wall Street analyst that, that maybe uh, you would be less familiar with is that IRR at the wellhead is not an SEC measure. So if you look in a 10K, you will not see any mention of wellhead uh, IRRs. You won't even see an IRR. You can search one. It's easily done. Uh, they're not allowed to use it. It's not a gap uh, measure. And that you know, speaks to the fact that these companies have basically been lying, and the market has lost tolerance with them, as you can see from the relative performance of the equities. I don't want to, uh, uh, you're going to sound like I'm obsessed with cost of capital, but you, it depends on the cost of capital used to work out what the, the discounted oil price is with the oil equity. So for example, you'd say if I put the future strip into the oil equities and back out the cost of capital, it's much lower than you would anticipate. The proxy of pay, executive pay, uh, to growth, because growth is a proxy for returns, is also breaking down. Yeah? So the, the fact is, in the past, you paid the executives to grow the company because you assumed the oil price would be higher in the future. That's falling apart as well. So I think all of this stuff is very much up in the air. 
as to uh, you know, what true returns are and how you define them. It's also undermined by the cycle, so that the old school, you know, very kind of easy to calculate full IRR of an oil sands project is, is very difficult when you're running shale economics. So I think it's a very long way of saying I don't know, and we're not sure how you calculate long-term returns for these companies. One thing that we, I would highlight is that a reason for the lack of consolidation in the industry is executive pay, because the managements are very highly paid with relatively low equity shareholdings, and therefore they're incentivized to keep running the companies on the old growth method rather than sell the company and consolidate it, uh, simply because they don't own much equity. So if you look at the large deals that were done last year, which were um, uh, most recently Bill, uh, excuse me, uh, Clayton Williams was one, and Rice Energy were the two that were done last year that were relatively big consolidation. Those were both high insider ownerships. That is to say the management owned a lot of stock and they sold the company. If you look at someone like Anna Darko that's performing relatively poorly, although better recently, the management owned hardly any stock, but he makes $15 million a year. He has $350,000 of annual uh, private plane use for his own personal use, and he has the best box at the Houston Astros. He's not a guy that necessarily wants to sell it to Exxon. So again, I think when you come back down to full, you know, what, what do we need to do here to get the sector to, be, to change behavior, it's actually most people on Wall Street will now say it's executive pay and ownership of the companies. Well, they're not. The, the, question was, <laughs> it, no. the question is, is it helpful to see statements that companies are making money at $40? Wells are making money at $40. Okay, so it allows you to drill more wells. The, uh, somewhere in, in the answer to this, there was an implicit, uh, is the full cycle production the production full cycle, how does that coincide with the price cycle? And the two aren't necessarily the same. I mean, you could start a well when, when you could begin to invest in a well when, when prices are low, and if, if it comes on stream at a time when the price goes high, you make a lot of money. If you've done the opposite, it's, it's a problem. Um, Dave Knapp, and Dave, uh, quick question, quick answer, and then we can do one more, and then I think it'll be time for lunch. Um, Paul mentioned consolidation. Hold on for the microphone right behind you. Paul, uh, David Knapp, uh, Energy Intelligence. Um, Paul mentioned consolidation, but there's a different type of consolidation that we really haven't talked about that I think fits into this uh, matching cash flow with uh, uh, with their spending, and that has to do with uh, what you'd call the Scott Sheffield's de-diversification of the business, and it's he's getting rid of non-core uh, acres, which which gets you money, uh, but non-core to one guy isn't necessarily non-core to another guy, and so this rash geographic rationalization, you might call it, I think is an important phenomena that we haven't talked about yet. So I'd like to get your actually uh, we did talk about it. It was on the, if I don't if slide I don't remember number correctly. thirty-three. Yeah, and whereas uh, the first point was the slide that I identified as the most important slide in my deck. Uh, the second point is that Alice ranks precisely to your point. Okay. Companies that stick to the knitting and do it extremely well will win out. In our okay, yeah. so ask and answer. Um, Paul, I want to dispute your wisdom of the crowd. Um, I did my decade and a half on Wall Street. I uh, was less impressed with the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, in fact, my friend Buff Brown has an ex expression called, it's very dangerous being smarter than the market. You know, how many times did the king of Saudi Arabia die when maybe two times it was true, and every single time prices went up, but why wouldn't they go down? Uh, the other thing, I was on the crude oil advisory committee and I gave a presentation to the New York uh, uh, Stock Exchange where I said that the, the NYMEX is the most efficient misprocessor of misinformation in the history of economics. Um, they didn't like that very much, but it, it is true. So, I mean, you make money by being in front of the guy that's behind you that's either buying or selling and you go the right way. So uh, Dave, we'll take, that, we'll take that as a short statement rather than a short question. <laughs> that's a short statement. My question was asked and answered. And thank you for letting me have two questions.
Ad Adam had a regression which showed that the future strip uh, is a very poor predictor of prices, but it's a hell of a lot better than analysts. Uh, you have the data to prove that. Yeah. Didn't you? <laughs> I still have that, actually. Last question. Is there anybody over on this side of the room, just in case we... we uh, Ken Austin. Um, I'm wait, wait. Okay. I'm, I'm still confused about why anybody would even put a premium on growth. I mean, if you're building a long cycle investment, then 10 years from now it will get you a stream of income. But I mean, although the shale decline rates aren't as dramatic as maybe people thought they were, um, what difference does it make when you start a well? Uh, what the price is going to be in 10 years, most of your, your oil and your income stream will be gone. So why grow now? Don't you want to look just, a, you know, three, four, five years out? Right. What's, well, the, appropriate, think, again, what's the, the appropriate time again, the frame for an is investment? The, the, the sector has been crushed, right? So there's obviously a major message from the market that there's an issue here. Secondly, that that's the question of uh, inventory, for example, which I asked Pioneer earlier, which is they have 70 years of inventory. There's a very debatable value to that, that, the, that we're currently trying to decide you know, what that is. Should they divest it? Should they, how should that be managed? And, and again, it goes back to the cost of capital. It's like, how much are you going to pay me over the next 10 years is illustrated by the performance of the refining stocks, as I said. If I'm just looking at what the market's telling me, as opposed to the performance of what we'd call a go-go growth stock, particularly in natural gas, where the market's basically taking valuation down massively, and, and even more so amongst the oil service names. So I think the market's telling you that, 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 yeah, you're right, there is a very significant question about that, particularly when you think about the fact that you could have invested in Amazon or in Tesla. You know, the market's sending you that strong signal, and, the market, and what we're saying is the companies have to change behavior, and they have to change in executive pay, if they're going to stay relevant. And they can't keep doing what they did in the past. Um, would you all please uh, join me in thanking Jan Stewart, Paul Sankey, and Roger Devon. The, uh, I, I have a couple of, uh, of uh, procedural announcements. The lunch is back there uh, by the coffee and windows where you were this morning. I think we could come back in here and use the, use the tables. And then at 12.45, we're going to start with a presentation from uh, Velo Kuskra. Uh, final comment on, Ken, on you know, why you continue to make investments. It's possible uh, that when companies look at the forecast for oil production, even the lowest forecast with peak oil demand uh, have a need for about 75 million barrels a day of oil production in the year 2040. So somebody is going to be producing a lot of oil in the year 2040 or 2050. And, uh, and it's not all going to be coming from shale. Right. Should you do it now or should you do it later? Good question. Let's talk about it at lunch. <laughs>